At any given year, one in four Australians are going to be experiencing mental health challenges. Muslims are definitely not immune. I experienced like suicidal thoughts for the first time, having such struggles. I can't trust my own thoughts, but I can't trust my friends. I just didn't know who to talk to. Like I was so afraid to even speak to a psychologist about it. Because growing up, you found a way to do it. You didn't ask for help. We want to be preventative before things uh, feel overwhelming and we've lost that sense of hope. And you think life would be better if you were removed from it. It's a terrible way to live your life. Mental health is more than the absence of illness. It is more than just being happy with life. When we have a look at what the World Health Organization uh, refers to in terms of mental health, it's essentially a state of well-being. We are able to reach our full potential. We are uh, responding appropriately to the normal stresses of life. And we're also able to contribute to our community. It really boils down to this. Mental health refers to our ability to respond to challenges. And this is also going to include challenging the conditioned beliefs that we hold about ourselves, about others, and the world. My name is Heba El Masri and I'm a qualified optical mechanic. I was born and raised here in Melbourne, so I'm an Aussie girl, but my background is Egyptian. Growing up, being a cultured Muslim, dark-skinned girl was difficult initially. I think in a world where racism is quite prevalent, it was hard to adjust. Essentially, when we come into the world, uh, we are entirely dependent on our caregivers, our parents, to meet all of our emotional needs. As well intended as parents sometimes are, not every single interaction we have with them is going to be meeting all of our emotional needs in that moment. When this becomes a repetitive experience, uh, we end up creating stories, narratives about what this means. And when these uh, narratives and stories that we tell ourselves to survive our childhood become repetitive, they form into beliefs. Some of these beliefs are going to support us and help us to reach our full potential, and others are going to lead us to feel stuck as an adult. I'm Anas, I'm 26, I'm South African, and I'm a youth worker and a mental health advocate. The very first time I had suicidal thoughts and was really confused on what was going on. Tried to speak to my friends at the time, but they pretty much just shut me down and thought I was just being overdramatic. I wouldn't say afraid was the word. I think it was more like, I just don't feel like it's worth sharing with them from what the comments I've got. I remember just having like a panic attack in front of my house and my grandma was in the car. Later then, like my grandma told my mom, oh, I didn't know he had anxiety. But I remember my mom being so upset. They make those small comments, but they never ask me personally, how am I doing? Or when they do, it's like a forced, how are you doing? Like, it's not like a genuine, how are you doing, if that makes sense? Throughout my life, mental health was not really discussed or understood. There was no time for being upset. You never cried about silly little things. We had a nickname for mum and, and that was Xena. She was like this princess warrior. She was strong and brave and quite often busy. And so we wouldn't bother her. By not bothering her means that we didn't really acknowledge how we were feeling. It, it, it's almost, like crying or being upset or being even sad was considered a vulnerability that was wrong. With my mom, it's been good. My dad, he, I guess he finds his support in other ways. He wouldn't personally ask me, am I okay or what's going on? He would find other ways to say that or bring it to the table. When I first started my struggles, I thought it was just me. He didn't understand what was going on. 
or he just didn't want to go there until I spoke to one of my sisters about it and then he, she was like he's like that's all of us it's not just to you I think I'm slowly understanding that he does support me in other ways or us as like siblings in other ways too So one in four individuals in Australia experience a mental health challenge every year. And Muslims are by no means immune to this. One of the biggest areas for me in my life that brings me so much joy and happiness is my work, is what I do. Because I love what I do and I've done it for 20 odd years. The struggle for me really came when I was retrenched our department was going to be absorbed into another team just after coming out of lockdown. It wasn't until after that that I really struggled because I felt a sense of purpose around it. Anyone who knows who I am knows that I'm the glasses specialist. <laughs> that's what I do, that's what I love. I felt like I'd lost a sense of my identity. At the time, you know, my husband and I spoke about how it was a good thing that I was retrenched. It gives me opportunity to work in the family business, um, the opportunity to be home a bit more and to be around the family. It should have been a positive moment, but it wasn't. I was going to work part-time or started working part-time with my husband. It wasn't until I realised I, I can't do this job. I tried to verbalise it as much as I can that I wasn't happy and I was struggling helping work in the family business. There was a sense of unhappiness from him. At that point, I could tell that he took a back seat. After that, I pulled right back because to feel like I was vulnerable and open in disclosing how I felt. And I didn't feel like a safety net was put underneath me. In fact, it was removed. I, I disconnected. And I think that for me was the biggest part where I just started to spiral. The research shows us that individuals from a linguistically and culturally diverse background are underrepresented in terms of seeking mental health support. They often uh, access support at points of crisis and because they are presenting quite late, they're generally more unwell than the broader community and more likely to be in need of medication support because their symptoms are so much more severe. One of the core reasons why people struggle to reach out for mental health support is the stigma that comes with doing that. People are afraid of being labelled. Sometimes it's crazy, sometimes it's dangerous. People are afraid of bringing shame to their family or to themselves. It's an isolating experience sometimes when you're struggling and it feels like you're the only one who's there and that nobody understands what you're going through. I was wondering when I experienced grief for the first time last year in May with the sudden loss of my grandfather. It was me being in denial the whole time that he was gone, even though seeing his like body still in denial until they wrapped his face. And then that's when I, it hit me when I realised this actually happened and it was like a nightmare and I just tried to wake up from it, but I just couldn't. I probably felt really alone and like knowing that no one can take away the way I felt was probably the hardest and like lowest point, one of the lowest points in my life. I remember when I went and told my father that I was getting a divorce and despite telling him everything that had happened in the marriage, one of his first reactions was, what are people going to say? How are you going to live your life with two, two children? How are you going to do that on your own? 
there was this notion that I should be in a situation that's not great because it creates an, an image where, I, where I'm a family unit. And I was gobsmacked. So it didn't matter if I was unhappy, but what mattered was that I was in a marriage. I remember leaving my mum and dad's house so deflated. The cultural shame and guilt that, that I felt was incredibly heavy. Experiencing those suicidal thoughts around the time where the world was going downhill with the terrorism and everyone within my community was like easy targets, especially here in Australia with like Islamophobia on the rise and me being confused with my mental health, having police officers come into my house and saying, oh, we got calls saying that you're suicidal and me being confused on like who the hell was saying that. It just kept pushing me down and down and I had nowhere to go or like no one to turn to. The simple doorbell ring because such anxiety attacks because I would think it's someone after me who's gonna arrest me for having mental health issues or being a brown guy living in Australia. Having such struggles, I can't trust my own thoughts. I just didn't know who to talk to. I was so afraid to even speak to a psychologist about it. It was a time where you just thought it was you against the whole world and no one no one was, was, was able to pull, pull me out of it. I think when I was in some of the darkest days, um, I definitely felt embarrassed. How I then conducted myself every day wasn't healthy. You know, there was definitely a lot of negative self-talk. I would get up every morning to take the kids to school. So regardless whether I was working or not, after taking them to school, I would come back home and in some cases jump right back in bed. You know, just staying in bed all day. And I found myself going through not wanting to eat, not wanting to um, be awake, not wanting to face the day. I kind of felt like I'd given up on existing because it was, I just didn't care. I think all areas of my life started to, to completely decline. I know I lost an extreme amount of weight. I could feel it, but I didn't acknowledge it. Disconnecting from, from reality and from people, not wanting to see family and friends, from being such a social person to kind of disconnecting completely. So I knew there was quite a lot of things that were happening because I was consciously aware of what I was doing. And this is what I couldn't understand. If I'm consciously aware of what I'm doing and my behaviour, how come I can't stop it? Because if I don't stop it soon, something bad's going to happen. It was destructive. When your mental health is um, injured or ill, uh, symptoms are going to be much more severe and they're going to be debilitating and they are going to impact the quality of your life. Perhaps they're going to lead to things like social withdrawal, uh, absenteeism at work, you're not going to be able to think. A common misconception amongst many faiths, including uh, in the Muslim community, is that experiencing mental health challenges is a sign of low faith or low iman. Now this is not the case. We all experience setbacks and challenges and ad adversity in life. It's just part of the human condition, right? And we know from ayats in the Quran and the lives of the prophets that they too also experience hardship. They too also experience loss and grief. In fact, we know from uh, stories of our prophet, peace be upon him, that he had the year of sadness, the year that he lost both his uh, wife and his uncle, his two trusted uh, supports on his journey. Our Prophet, peace be upon him, was a human, and all humans, just like him, are not immune from feeling their emotions.
when I hold stuff inside, I'm being too negative. My brain will, will just be like, oh, you're sharing too much or, or don't share that, it's better to be quiet. When I have suicidal thoughts, even to this day, I keep inside a lot. The reaction I have gotten before from previous friendships, the comments I got was to man up or just get over it. It was that instant like rejection. I was shut down. I can never tell anyone really like, oh, I'm feeling suicidal right now. When I would just try again, like with another group of friends or a couple of people who I thought would like be my friends who actually understand what I'm going through. The most common response I would get was like, I get you. You don't get me. And then suddenly I find myself in a position that is so incredibly difficult. And even just as a cultured woman, to now go through another divorce, you know, the guilt and the shame associated with that, let alone what my purpose was in life, now I look like a failure in front of my children, was just too much. It was, it was too much to, to deal with. And from being such a positive, happy person to just hating life. To reach a point where you don't want to wake up in the morning and you think life would be better if you were removed from it is just, it's a terrible way to live your life. The truth is, you don't have to try and navigate this space on your own. There is help. There are people trained to be able to guide you through this journey of coming back to yourself, to a place where you feel grounded, where you feel regulated, where you feel comfortable with connecting to yourself, you feel comfortable in social interactions and relationships and you're able to access life that's full of joy and ease. I remember being on my prayer mat where I'm praying and I'm connecting and that's when I find I can, I can open up, I can cry, I can be vulnerable and I'm not going to be judged by someone. You know, for me, I always feel like God's got my back. And I, I remember thinking to myself, I'll put in the hard work. You know, I had this conversation with God. I'll put in the hard work. I'll do whatever it takes. Just point me in the right direction because I don't know what direction to take. It's, I don't know what happened, but something just clicked one morning and I just went, I can't be living this life. This is, this is bullshit. I can't live like that. I can't show my children that that's acceptable. And so that's what gave me the courage to really focus on, I've got to get well, I've got to get better, I've got to think better. That for me was kind of the, the starting point of, of driving that ship into getting the right mental health back on track, getting a therapist. I think it was after I was starting to seek professional help with a psychologist back in 2019 and I happened to ask her, oh, um, is there any way I can share my story? And she's like, oh, I might have something for you. And then within the next session, she's like, oh, I've got news for you. There's actually this reference group you can join. And then from there, I've started to discover my passion for mental health and like speaking up about my struggles for my community. And just from then till now, present, every now and then with sharing my story, last month we've been a forum with 1,300 people or to front of a camera. It's a good time now to share my story. If I could give any advice, would be just to speak. Surround yourself with people that love you and value you and support you. So when you do feel safe and comfortable enough to speak out, you know you're not gonna be turned away. You know you're not gonna be burdened. You just open up. With previous friends, when they ask, when you feel like this, what, what do you want me to do for you? Like, what, what, what can I do for you? And 
I've told them loads of times just being there like or just sitting by me is enough I would always struggle with my mental health knowing that to just be in the moment and things would fall into place when it's meant to. Research shows that 50% of minority groups who engage in mental health services don't continue after the first session. This shows us that often individuals from minority groups don't feel like they are understood when they seek help. Sometimes there's an experience of perceived judgment. Sometimes they feel the burden of having to explain how their culture and faith might be playing into the challenges that they're experiencing. It's really important that we have uh, options for minority groups where they feel safe. In some communities, mental health is still a taboo topic. I've been working with the Muslim community for almost two decades and during that time we have come a long way in terms of seeking help when we need it. By talking about mental health openly, it gives us an opportunity to fight against the stigma. It gives us an opportunity to reduce the shame associated with, with getting help. It helps us to dispel the myths around feeling unwell and it also normalises seeking support. The biggest takeaway is surrounding yourself with a community, a village that supports you because we can't do it on our own. If you are experiencing mental health challenges right now, you are not alone. There is absolutely no shame in reaching for support because support is available.